food and cooking is the one safe subject that I can talk to my parents about without it becoming like a fight <laughs> at the end. <laughs> I'm Kat. Hi. If these are my dogs. They're, oh. They'll be hanging out with us if you see them in the background. <laughs> they I are. am Chinese American. I was born in China. M- immigrated when I was five. I don't know if you want to introduce yourself, Carol. Yeah. Hi, I'm Carol. Um, I grew up in LA as the children of child of immigrants, not children. Um, and I now live in New York City, so a little bit away from the food ethnic enclave that I grew up in. Um, and I will not be cooking with you guys, but I do know the recipe that you're doing well enough to be able to talk about it too, because it's one of our favorites. Cool. Mm-hmm. Um, what are we making? Yeah. We're making yu xiang qie zi. Um, which is like an eggplant dish that is, I mean, literally in, tra- in translation, it's like fish flavored eggplant, but we're not actually, there's no fish in this dish, which is oh. one of those idiosyncratic things. No, there's a history to that. Um, it's because the like, I don't know if this is a real story or not, but like the myth of it is that it was originally the sauce was for a fish dish. And then she just had a bunch of eggplant that she needed to cook. And because it was such like a great sauce, she put it on that. And then Yishang Chizu was born. Oh, Carol. That's the awesome so story right here. <laughs> I didn't even know that. <laughs> so when I was a kid, I loved this dish. I also love Yishang Rou Su, which is a different dish, but it's the s- similar origins or from mm-hmm. Sichuan. And I used to get it all the time whenever it was, whenever we're out at restaurants. Um, and, but these days I'm trying to eat less meat, um, environmental reasons, animal rights reasons. And so um, this is actually perfect because I can use impossible meat to make it and it actually tastes exactly the same. Um, impossible is a great product. <laughs> so I'm so psyched because I can make this dish vegan and it's still tastes exactly like the thing that I loved when I was a kid so I, I awesome. I'm excited about it yeah so yeah, the that reason is awesome. I know that <laughs> is because my husband is vegetarian and when you have a vegetarian husband and you go home to eat all the Chinese food you learn very quickly that there is meat hiding in everything so all of the names of everything were like I've all of a sudden been like questioning my mom like why is it called this like is there actually meat in this somewhere is there fish in this somewhere he's not as such like strict about fish but um that's how I know that because we had to do some investigations into like what was in each dish yeah um I was a vegetarian for about a decade um I'm not now um so I'm making this dish with pork um but when I I when I was a vegetarian we didn't have impossible meat it was not a thing so you're very lucky that as you foray into veganism that you <laughs> that you yeah, have there's no way mm-hmm. yeah I wouldn't be able to do um I don't know what to call myself I don't think I'm a vegan because I still eat meat products <laughs> um but I, I couldn't I dramatically reduce my meat intake without impossible I think they call it flexitarian now. Um, if you're like, I eat oh. sometimes. Yeah. I and to be honest, the... I only eat meat when it's like a cultural dish. When I, so I, um, one of the most soothing things for me is um, pork broth noodle soup or like some mm. kind of noodle soup thing. And it's just not the same without the pork bone. You have to simmer it for like three hours and it just is so good. And it's so comforting. Um, yeah, and it's, sure. That's when I eat meat, when it's Chinese food. Yeah, that's so true. That's kind of what I do too. Cause like with living with someone who's vegetarian, like our meat intake has just gone way, way down. But there are some dishes where I'm just like, mm, that's just that's just supposed to be meat. Like I don't know it any other way. And coming yeah. up with like new ways to eat like quote unquote meat dishes, like with impossible meat is like definitely one of the ways we've been like evolving how to keep our culture going and figure out what exactly is like Chinese food. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. 
I used to do lots of things with um, like mushroom and tofu to make Filipino food because again, like everything in the Philippines is either like fish or pork. Your vegetables have shrimp or pork or both. And so it just, it makes it so hard. And like going to the Philippines as a kid, people would just be like, I don't know what to tell you. There's, do you yeah. want chicken? Chicken's not a meat. Chicken, chicken's not a meat, right? Chicken like, can you get chicken. Yeah. <laughs> <Real common. laughs> and so it's like, so it's like, I want to be able to still like have like Filipino food. I still want to be able to like eat food from, you know, like my mom's country and then like, but still adhere to like my vegetarian or like pescatarian at the time principles. I mean, when I was a vegan, it was probably the hardest, but it's definitely how I learned how to like really flex my tofu and mushroom knowledge um, and I still do a lot of that now, even though um, we eat meat. And um, in the past few years, we've we've reduced how much meat we eat um, compared to like but when we first started being married together. It was weaning him slowly off the the chicken has been has been a a challenge. So things like this, even though there's just like a little bit of meat, can can appeal. Um, Kat, do you want to talk us through, or Carol, do you yeah. want to talk us through? Oh, go ahead. I can do it. I have the thing. So the first thing we're going to do is <laughs> cut eggplants into long strips. <laughs> yep. And um, I don't know how long I'm doing. I don't know. Is that six inches? I don't know. Here's the other thing about Chinese food. Carol, you can confirm to me. There's not really, like, measuring. It's just kind of, mm-hmm. you just do it. <laughs> and yeah. I'm sure it's like that for a lot of um like communities of color is just like yeah just throw some of that cut this into like approximately this shape and yeah. there's no right or wrong really it's just whatever yeah it's definitely like doing. it's definitely harder to like write a recipe or like take a recipe that like your family did that you know that you've been eating for a really long time and then say like oh let's put like ratios on that instead of just like oh you know it's, it's like a finger you have you have to use a finger of this and it's like well what's this what's a finger yeah. of like eggplant or like ginger is easy because it's it's like your thumb but there are other things that are just like I, I don't know what that is so you gotta like really work hard for it yep. yeah when so I what are we doing with like... eggplant cutting it cutting into strips like this that my eggplant okay was that there's a little bit of cool. skin on each um, strip. Mm-hmm. And what we'll want to do is put salt over it um, mm-hmm. so that <clears throat> the water content will kind of drain from the, the, the eggplant, the cool. meat of the eggplant. <laughs> our, meaty, our meaty fleshy bits. Yes, the fleshy bits, there we go. <laughs> Um, this is the trick I learned recently, but if there is less water in the eggplant, so if this is what I'm doing, I have it on a plate, I'm mm-hmm. just pouring some salt over it. Um, it's, it like soaks up less oil in the, the pan. Eggplant yeah. is pretty notorious for needing a lot of oil. And so it can mm-hmm. become, I don't know, not healthy or just like kind of gross. But yeah. apparently this trick, um, it ends up needing less oil in the pan. Yeah, I think that that's probably another reason why, like, my husband's just not into it, because he's like, it's just so spongy, and, like, why? Why does it have to be spongy? Yeah, because it soaks up all the flavors. It it soaks up all the flavor, exactly, (laughs) but, like, but, like, he's just like, can it just be dry? Can it be a dry thing? Like, Uh, not really. And then while we wait, while we wait for the water to kind of drain from the eggplant, we're going to mix soy sauce, black vinegar, sugar, salt, um, just cooking wine if you want, and some water. I got it. Bowl. And okay, I have not done that part yet. <laughs> yeah, I put I put like all of my um, soy sauces and wine and um, things in little bowls to get them. Get them going. Um, do you add the um, sugar and cornstarch to this part, or do you wait? I so I put sugar in there, 
and salt in there. Mm -hmm. The cornstarch okay. we will do to the eggplant directly. Okay. So this is the part where it's like a little bit of sugar. How, how much? It's up to you. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, I did. I did totally learn. Like I used to try to ask my mom about recipes and write them down. And then I learned what I actually had to do was just film her cooking them and ask her along the way, what are you doing now? How much of that? And she's like, I shake it until it covers all of this. And that's how you that's know. That's so clever. That's super clever. I've never thought about that. And I used to like call my mom and be like, what, what kind of, and she's like, you can just like Google it though. Like, right. Like they, they like have those recipes online and I'm like, but it's not the same. It's definitely not your recipe. Your recipe. So I'm looking for your thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. But maybe I should film her doing it next time. Um, I have a, I have a little handwritten booklet of my grandma's recipes um, that she wrote before she died. Like she's had them for like years and uh, my my family's like, oh, we know you're like the cook and like the baker in the family, so like we'll get these to you. Um, and that was really like sweet memento I have of hers. But I like even reading them, it's like <laughs> they're they're really just like you know, just add a little here, a little bit there to taste, to taste. Make sure you taste. taste. It. That's that's always like the that's always like the caveat. Make sure you're tasting things. Mm hmm. So I feel like there's like way. Oh, sorry, go ahead. You can go. I was just going to change the oh. subject. <laughs> I was just going to say that um, I feel like this, like, wave of, like, food blog age where, like, you have to do that kind of thing kind of changes the way that, um, like, the relationship to, like, culturally relevant food works. Um, like, there are so many, so many, like, not ethnic bloggers, not, not people of color who are like, oh, this is a great, you know, like, I've got this great, like, adobo recipe or, like, this, um, you know, like, a beef and broccoli recipe, and it's like, do you, do you know what you're doing? Like, what are we doing here? And I feel like part of that is, like, because, like, the, the, like, translation of, like, ratios and recipe writing down doesn't really happen that way for, for families like that. It's, it's more like, you watch, you learn, you do, or you, you learned it from like the way that it tasted. And that's just kind of how you remember how it tasted. And so you're like, that's close. Or like, that's exactly how it tasted with my, my family. But like, you don't really think about like the ratios. Totally. So because of the like cultural um, and generational gap between me and my parents, basically all of this is like food and cooking is the one safe subject that I can talk to my parents about without it becoming like a fight <laughs> at the end. so when Carol you were talking about like talking to your mom about how to cook things and like yeah I do that too and it's like the most pleasant conversations I have with my mom <laughs> Yes, those are the like only ways. Yeah, it's like the only safe topic to connect with her on where like, I can feel like we're having like a mother daughter connection, but it doesn't turn into a fight about something about my life choices, or mm -hmm. life choices of my families or friends or anything like mm -hmm. that. It's like, one of the few things we can talk about for longer than five minutes. It's like this and plants. That's, that's it. That's awesome. Yeah, with with that sometimes though at the end it'd be like, so when are you having kids? I'm like, yep. mom, <laughs> out of nowhere, we almost went the whole call <laughs> without this being brought up. <laughs> yep, just no no oh, transition, so not at all. Just like when you have kids, we'll pay for babysitting for you, especially if you want to have them now. Okay, <laughs> Uns unsolicited. They're not like we'll so come and live new. with you and like. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <Child care. laughs> yeah, my mom, like when we lived in Detroit, my mom was like, listen, just wait a year or two and I'm going to retire and then you'll just have child care. Oh my God. And I was like, okay, great. And then we moved to Detroit and it was just like, I don't have child care now, but I don't have kids. So it kind of worked out that when we like moved back to New York, my mom was like, I'm retired you live here, I live here, we're like two miles away from each other, 
whenever you're ready. And we moved into this place and she was like, this, this uh, little second bedroom, cute nursery size. <laughs> it's like, or for the treadmill, you know, that too, that fits there. So. Like she's got grandchildren. She doesn't necessarily need them from me. I'm an only child. Are you an only child, Carol? I have an older brother, so he already has two kids. I so do. they're oh, they're wow. all just like, when's it your turn? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's how it is in my family. My mom's not really trying to put the pressure there, but um, I do have an older brother who has children, and they're grown, and so mm -hmm. like. Oh, yep. I've never ones. heard you talk about your siblings or your nieces or nephews. Yeah, they live in the Philippines. Um, oh, yeah, they live in the Philippines. So they're they're like college age or they're they're out of college. They have like lives and jobs. I think actually, how, wait, I think they're like only a couple of years younger than you had. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm pretty young. They're like, they're like maybe three or four years younger than you. They're like in their early 20s, so. Right, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then I have a younger got, brother got, who like, isn't there, mm -hmm. who isn't doing anything. He's just hanging out with my parents, being mm. younger brother. I've got some cousins who are really, really young. My, my family is spread out. Is, um, so I'm the only child, but my dad has a younger brother. And so that, those cousins are super young. And my mom has an older brother. And that cousin's really like a lot older than me. So I feel super isolated in my family. I'm not really close with any of my cousins. And I'll, also, I'm the only person who grew up in like North America, so we've just got very different values, and so we don't really mm -hmm. ever talk. And it's a little sad. There's a lot that um, isolates me from my culture. And to bring it back to food, food is what connects me to my culture. It's when I feel like I am, yeah, connected to my ancestry and like the past and the memories that I have. You know, taste is such a great sense because you can taste something and it just like be sent back in time and it's so vivid. Um, smell and taste. That is awesome. That's funny. That's actually like, <laughs> I'm very similar to that. Like, I'm also not really close to any of my cousins. Um, so my mom has three siblings but they're all in Taiwan and so all of my cousins are back in Taiwan and like I'm also like in between the two age groups like there's an older group that's like my brother's age because he's eight years older than me and then there's like a much much younger group and like every time I visited I couldn't figure out if I was supposed to be like taking care of the younger kids or playing with the younger kids um, so I never got close to them because they're all in Taiwan and then my dad has five siblings and only three of them came to the U.S. None of them were nearby. And the closest one was like 10 years apart from him in age. So also all mm -hmm. of her kids were 10 years yeah. apart from me. So it's like, I never got a chance to get close to any of them. And now that we're older, we talk a little bit more. And like, one of the few things we talk about is like food. And like, when we get together, we know we're going to be eating like similar stuff. Like that's one of those things that at least we don't have to like question. Mm -hmm. yeah, Recently, I called my grandparents for Chinese New Year, and it's like, so what'd you guys eat? <laughs> Yay! And that's that's like the one safe topic with like cross the that can cut through the cultural um, gap and differences. Uh, and it's like I don't know. It's I, I, my Chinese also is not great, but I can talk about food. <laughs> yes. Important. Yeah, my Tagalog is awful. Um, I sound like a five-year-old, um, but like there's there's like a joke for like Filipino Americans, like if you don't speak Tagalog well, you just sprinkle some po in there, like po po, and it's like the it's like the honorific for an older person. So you say like, oh, salamat po, thank you po, oh hi tita, how are you doing? You, you know, you just like pull out your toggles, sprinkle in some po, and they're just like. Wow, your Tagalog is so good. Like your <laughs> accent is on point, or like it's just it's just how you get by when you're like, mm, yeah, I feel so. And like it really was helpful when I was a community organizer working with like older Filipinos because I was like, I we we don't have necessarily like this language connect 
Um, even though like as a child, I spoke fluent Tagalog and like, as I got older, I lost that language having to go to school and they're like, you need to speak English. Like we're going to put you in ESL if you don't start speaking English. So it's very like, it's like punitive to not be able to speak language, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm just opening a window. <laughs> um, so yes, let's have some ventilation. Um, anyway, back to the recipe. It's been sitting in salty for a little while. It's it's mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's going. We'll be rinsing that soon. Um, okay. Do you have so in this time we're supposed to cut up, you know, the garlic, ginger. I'm putting in um, some Thai red chilies. Just um, yeah. I have I have or both spicy. like fresh chili and dried chili. Would you which would you think is better or both or one or the other? How spicy do you want to make it? I mean, it could be both. It could be both. I might okay. Let's do. I'll do one fresh, and then I'll do the rest dry. Um, I unfortunately, as I've gotten older, have lost my when it comes to spices <laughs> so I can't exactly do spicy the way that I used not to do spicy, spicy. No yeah worries. I can do spicy but not like super spicy okay so I'll no problem um I just realized should we have been soaking them in salty water this whole time I don't, I don't know I don't think so like matters. I also do the same thing you do where like yeah. it's yeah. just where it's just salt and then I do a quick rinse and then I, I was pressing my eggplant when you, when we first started um so yeah but I think it, I think it works the same because it's like dry and like kind of limpy but not right. you know overly wet I'm gonna use a pasta strainer for this next part, but we're gonna be drink like rinsing it and letting the water drain out. And so, um, cool. Whatever works. <laughs> I like this one because it folds up and it becomes it, it's easy for storage. It's compact. Nice. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm just I'm just preheating my pan in anticipation because working off of the induction burner is a little bit harder to maintain the heat when frying. I'm not at my stove. My walk is so big that I have to clear out the other things on my stove for it to fit. All right. So, I don't know, do you think we should Move on and put, yeah, we can get started. Yeah. yeah, we can get to that part. Okay. So I've got I've got it in two different plates because you the next part we're putting some cornstarch on it. I have potato starch. Mm -hmm. I don't think it matters. Um, and you want to yeah lay it out so that each egg piece has like the opportunity to have cornstarch on it. I don't even know what I'm saying right now. It's a good <laughs> coating. <laughs> yes, thank you. So we wanted a, a coated, coated well. Yes. Got it. Yeah, just a little bit. I'll do that. But... Yeah, I use tapioca starch. I think just any kind of like thin starchy flour is probably fine. Yeah. I've been making dumplings um, with impossible meat these days. And um, my mom taught me the trick of putting starch on the surface. So when you're making dumplings, you it can, whatever surface you put it on, it can stick. So typically you can put flour on the surface of the plate or whatever, so it doesn't stick. But if you put, put starch on it, it actually works even better um, mm. to prevent it from sticking to one mm. another. How does it yeah, make yeah, totally work dumplings? Today. Sorry. I'm sorry. What's that? Um, I asked Kat, how does it how does it mix as a dumpling filling? Like, does the texture match up? Oh, mm, I'm not putting in the dough. I'm just sprinkling on the surface of whatever oh, no. I'm placing the dumplings before I put it in the freezer. 
Caesar. Sorry, I meant the impossible meat. How does that work in the filling? <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's okay. not, it's actually great. It's not as um, uh, fatty. Mm. So mm. I think that at first I could definitely taste the difference. It's a little less satisfying, but nowadays I've, I've actually just, I've been eating it for a couple of days. Um, I've just gotten used to it and I think it's fine. I mean, so it's a little less fatty. It still tastes great. And um, that's something. Yeah. That's sweet. It's, um, it is great. I and feel I'm like making some popcorn you. too. I know, right? <laughs> there's not a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of vegan Chinese food yeah. like people out there. Seriously. So, yeah, for <laughs> sure, for sure. Yeah, whenever yeah. whenever we go back to LA, we like either have to be very careful about like asking what's in everything. And like you mentioned earlier, Crystal, they're like, oh, there's no meat, it's just chicken. And you're like, right. <laughs> <laughs> or like, oh, the it's like soaking in like a porky broth, right. but we can just drain that off for you, right? Like that's fine, right? Yeah, so that we works. typically like have to find the, there's like Buddhist vegetarian restaurants and like they're totally on top of it. So there's like mm-hmm, a subset mm-hmm. of Chinese food that is like very vegetarian, but it's like, you have to find them. It's not, it's not what's as mainstream, yeah. I think. Yeah. When I lived My in LA, to go to this Taoist. really good. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Just going to say my dad is a Taoist and, and recently become um practicing and so now he's vegetarian too just want to throw that out there yeah okay i'm done with the starch part you crystal you still working Um, i'm not but i'm still working on it but i also cut like a larger amount it's cool i'm I'm being like it's all good and i could just really be you're being much more precise than i am i just put my I plant on a plate and sprinkled starch over it. You're actually you're actually uh, coating. I'm trying. <laughs> you would put much on. I'm, I'm trying to like do very thin coats. Um, great. Okay. We're just gonna. I'm sure yours will taste better than mine. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. I'm sure it'll, it'll both be delicious. All right. Yeah. We okay. can we can start frying, and I can do a little bit more of this as we as I fry. Okay. Yeah, so we'll, so we'll be frying them in batches. You don't want to crowd the eggplant in the pot, right. so there's definitely going to be downtime between the batches. And I'm going to turn on my ventilator. Or what is it called? That one. That thing. Is that oh, going to like... What's it called? Range hood? I don't like know what's that hood. Is, should yeah. I mute myself for this part? I and actually can't hear it. Chat? I can't no, hear it. I can't hear it, no. I heard it when you first it's heard it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can't hear it. Either. Okay. All right. We're using a healthy dose of oil <laughs> for this dish. Healthy dose of oil. You got it. Yeah. You know, I mean, we did we did do the salt trick, so it shouldn't need too much oil. But yeah, it's still. Mm-hmm. I mean, the more oil, the better tasting it'll be, right? Unfortunately. <laughs> right. 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 I mean, fat is Actually, flavor, as they say. Yes. My parents used to get into this fight with my grandparents all the time when they got older and had, as you age, you just have health stuff. Um, and so they, my parents would always be encouraging them to use less oil in their cooking. And they were always like, get out of here with that. No, it doesn't taste as good. <laughs> There's no way. It's like, it, no, but you have diabetes and you should watch oh. what you eat. It's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I figure if you can get to a certain age, like why? I know that that's like, I mean, that's definitely a common thing on both sides of my family that like diabetes, high blood pressure, um, and like, it's considered like cultural food is like bad for you because it's so like fatty or it's, you know, whatever, but it's like, you know, actually it's not terrible for you. And if you get to a certain age, like why the hell not do what you need to do? Yeah. Food is one of those greatest pleasures of life. And so why do yeah, it's it's important to enjoy life. There's a fine balance we must strike with 
enjoying life sure. in the present and also planning for the future. Totally. Yeah. But I think it's all of the trauma that my family, well, I mean, it's interesting because my grandparents definitely had a lot just of hardship in their life, but my parents are super careful and very, very cautious and very future oriented, like always have to plan for the future. I always have to save your money, <laughs> save this, save that. Um, and it's just, I think the poverty that they experienced when they were children, it's really mm-hmm. sticking with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of just like the uncertainty in the worlds that they lived in were just so different from how it is now that I don't think that's something you ever really let go of and just have even only gone through like we've only gone through a year of the pandemic but it feels like much longer mm-hmm. than that so I imagine going through like multiple years of this especially in your young years like really does a number on you so I, I try to have empathy for what they're going through while also recognizing it makes it very difficult sometimes to be their child <laughs> for sure yeah oh my goodness and I didn't used to have an appreciation for these things when I was a teenager or even a young adult um, and it was it's one of those things it's a, it's hard to see your parents as humans as complex flawed like all humans are but that's what they are yeah okay yeah. so <laughs> at this point you want to see the eggplant browning and if you do, you can okay. flip it over and just fry the other sides. Um, okay. Why having a wok is great. Just the geometry of the wok makes sure that it, the heat is dispersed evenly. Mm-hmm. I think. <laughs> I, to be honest, I, I think that's like why. Bit, okay, I feel a little bit of imposter syndrome right now. Just like. How, who am I to be talking about this with any authority? Um, someone who could eat it. it. Yeah, someone who could eat it. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I think, All right. I think that's, that's what this is, right? Like, it's, it's okay to, like, reclaim shit that's yours and not feel, don't feel imposter about it, you know? It's yours. Live it up. Yeah. And just like for me, when I first started cooking on my own, like I had no idea how to not stir fry anything. That was what I wanted to do with everything. So I cooked everything on high and just like pushed it around constantly. (laughs) And that does not work all the time. So I'm glad I have reclaimed a walk to be able to do that because I I don't know how to cook any other way. So when every side of the eggplant is like a nice brown color, ooh, this one looks great. Oh, yes. Ooh, nice. <laughs> but this side is not brown yet so I want to make sure all of the sides are looking okay. toasty and we're gonna be cooking a little bit more later so so after yeah, so after they're slightly brown in batches, then mm-hmm. we're putting the like peppercorns if we have them in oil and then putting everything back into the pot. So this is just like okay. the pre-frying stage. I don't know. We're frying it again later. So we're cooking okay. it more afterwards. Cool. I'm going to grab a plate and, and put some paper towel down. Yeah, the end result of this dish will be like, it'll, the, the eggplant will taste not mushy, but it's kind of like a little mushy. Nice and soft, tender. It's just so like tender. Tender. (laughs) That's a good cooking word. (laughs) That's a great cooking word. My eggplant smells so good. Ah, I just like. I want to like eat it now. Fried foods are just so good. Like even shallow yeah. fried like this is like so good. All right, that's my first batch. 
I'm going to try to get more in here, but not crowd it too much. So when would y'all typically eat this? Is this like weeknight? Is it like special occasion? Is it like whenever you feel like it? Or is it just like when you go out? So in my family, this was when we go out to restaurants um, because my mom is very health conscious. And so she wouldn't, I don't think she would typically make something like this, but it's, I think it's a pretty casual dinner dish. Yeah, pretty like any day, like weeknight thing. My mom would make this. My brother really likes eggplants. So this is also like on common rotation in our house. And Hi. that's pretty much how we would eat it now too at home when Kevin's doing the cooking because he also likes eggplants. And it's like one of the dishes that he like can recognize on a menu and like knows to look oh. for. Um, awesome. So it's it's pretty like it's on standard rotation with us, yeah. Yeah, the uh, paper towel trick is good, Crystal. I hadn't actually thought about that, but yeah, just you can pat it a little bit. Just give it a little resting place while oh. I like go to find the next batch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, we are getting really crispy now. I'm so excited. Like at first it was like, not. <laughs> I think that's a traditional cooking term. Like it doesn't, it's not there yet. It's still like mushy and the oil is not up high enough. But we're here, we're ready, we're fried. So the other thing that was on my mind while thinking about food is um, how if like when I was so when I was a kid, if my mom packed my lunch for me, it would always be leftovers. Mm -hmm. And it was so I um, grew up in Montreal and Vancouver, Vancouver, a lot of Asian people um, was great. Um, I had Asian classmates. And so it felt a lot more welcoming, but in I remember mm -hmm. some big, pretty traumatic memories of getting bullied at school because my lunch smelled weird or looked weird or like, what is that mm -hmm. you're eating? Um, and like, I used to resent being Chinese and having weird food and had to, I don't know, go through a stage of, of rebelling against my heritage of trying my best to not be Chinese. Just like, if I try hard enough, I can be white um, and completely like, I took pride in being a banana, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. Mm -hmm. And it's been, it's been a, 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 quite a journey to come back around from that and being proud of uh, my heritage. Yeah, I totally have similar um, the memories of being a child and going to school with like adobo or like um, corned beef hash sandwiches or like spam sandwiches because it's like it's easy, it's fast, and you can like get yourself ready to go. And my my parents were always just like, "Just take it cool, it's fine, it's no big deal," you know. And all the other kids are like on their PB and J jam and. Yeah. Here I am with my adobo. <laughs> They're like, what's going on? Why do you have rice? Why is there a whole ass dinner plate in your lunchbox right now? <laughs> yeah. And I too, I too had similar feelings of like not wanting to be, like wanting to be more assimilated. Um, and I learned real quick, like, yeah, you know what? That's that's not who I am. That's not what I want. That's not what I want to be. Um, I'm I'm okay with being. Filipino and okay with being black and but it took it took some time it took some time to not feel that hate that yeah definitely the kids and want I, to influence and you it, to feel and for me it took hearing other stories um like this is why representation matters it's beyond just like I don't know like on paper hiring certain actors for certain jobs it's like when I started 
hearing other stories of people struggling with the same thing. Um, that's what helped me understand mm -hmm. the problem in trying to just assimilate and trying to throw away um, my ethnic culture. I don't know. I, I don't really know how to describe it other than just like hearing other stories and that like, that helped me. Yeah, I think for me it was um, going to a predominantly white uh, liberal arts college um, and seeing that there were there were literally only four Filipinos on campus, um, and then like later on we got you know a couple more, but like the the entire student of color population at my undergrad was thirteen percent, and that included international students and grad students who didn't live on campus, and so it was just like it. It, it caused me to like want to cling harder to um, to being more Filipino, to be you know more black, to be to being like ultra um, and caring more about that than like wanting to feel assimilated because other kids who were at the same college and you know it's like oh you look like me you eat the same thing <laughs> like that's awesome let's be friends you know instead of like being like how can I be more white <laughs> I don't want to be more white. I want to be more brown. Mm -hmm. How can I be more brown? Yeah. Um, and I, I think part of it, like in being um, biracial, there's, a, there's also like an element of being like, I want to be accepted as an Asian American because I don't look like one. And so it's like, uh, can you accept me too? And like, and for some people, you know, it's like, yeah, that's, that's what's up. But others, it's, it's not so much. And um, this, this whole like, Black Asian, uh, you know, as, as we like look at us as like against one another, there's so much more um, that we have in common than we don't. And it's so yeah. weird that like, that like that divide can can exist. And it's like, it's totally like rooted in white supremacy, right? But like, it totally but don't, you is. don't see it when you're in it. You don't see it when you're in it. You're, yeah. you're just like, oh, it's it's competitive instead of being like, no, we're the same. We're we're just the same in terms of our oppression and like I mean, yeah. I mean, you know. You know, you study this, <laughs> you do this work. Oh yeah. No, it is the mechanism of white supremacy to pit minorities against each other. They want us to fight. Sure. But I want to cut in because I'm on the next step. Um I'm a little okay. faster maybe because I have less. But um you have less. Have That's okay, go ahead. Oh yeah, citron peppercorns, um, mala, okay. whatever. They're like little, I don't know. They make the thing you're eating tingly and numb, but in a good way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love those. Put that in the oil and fry for a little bit. And then I'm putting my meat okay. in. Okay, so I will have my meat now. Yeah, this is a, so. This is a um, a dish from the Sichuan like region, and they're mm -hmm. known for their spicy numbing peppers and spicy dishes that numb your mouth. It's definitely an acquired taste. Like my white husband Charles does didn't used to like it, um, but I think it's because when he's had it in restaurants, they weren't very good. Like maybe they overused the peppers, mm -hmm. or maybe it was like the only like the numbness was the like was too much or something was the only taste or the only flavor in the dish so but nowadays yeah. he enjoys the lemon peppers whenever I eat I guess that there's like there's like an under undertone of like a floral fruity smell that exists like even though it's like spicy and numbing and like sometimes it can be overpowering if it's like too much or um sometimes you don't even like get it it, it doesn't exist it's not not in there yeah so i i get that i get i get why like you can have bad responses and be like yeah. I, I don't think i'm into that anymore all right my eggplant I is done like that you said floral that's cool mm -hmm. I, I would agree <laughs> it's like it's got like this like kind of like fruity yeah. floral smell to it but like if you're ignoring the spicy bits it's like oh okay i see that yeah, that's different. Right. I'm going to add my sure. meat. Um, I think I need to go in a couple minutes. So I just wanted to add okay. that 
when we were talking about um, identity earlier, it's mine was a little bit different because I grew up in basically like the epicenter of Asian immigrants in North America, mm-hmm. um, in LA, where it's basically like an ethnic enclave slash ethnoburb. So for us, like, I never really had to question my minority identity because we weren't really minorities there. And it wasn't until I left that I like learned about how crappily people are treated elsewhere. But also like, it was when I really actually had to think about like, going to the grocery store doesn't automatically mean going to the Asian grocery store now, like that has to be Mm. special. And it's been like a continued sort of like, I guess not exactly struggle, but figuring out of like, okay, how do I like intentionally keep this culture to be a part of my life rather than it just being the default? Because that's just what it was where I grew up. Like mm-hmm. when my parents first moved there, the closest Chinese grocery store was like maybe an hour away. And then it just got closer and closer and closer. And now there are like five of them within 15 minutes. And now that I live in New York where it's not quite the case, I'm like, okay, do I want to continue to make this part of my life and how do I do that and so food has definitely been one of those things where like as our world shrunk during the pandemic like Chinatown was one of the few places that I still kept going to for like various reasons and Mm -hmm. one of them was to support that community and one of them was to make that food that made me feel at home. Absolutely yeah for sure like living in Detroit where and where we lived it was a very um big uh Middle Eastern population, um, and especially where we live, there is also like a Polish population that existed. And so, I mean, and even even where we live now in New York, it's like it's like there are our neighbors are Chinese, our neighbors are Japanese, but like there's no grocery store. There's like one Japanese grocery store, and you have to go to like other parts of Queens to really um, access like Asian ingredients. They don't exist in our normal grocery store, um, and. I, I was fortunate to grow up in Flushing um, for a time and, and like in, in a time when like I was doing lots and lots of cooking in our household. Um, and it, it, it was just so great that you could just like down the street, like here's four or five grocery stores. Here's like the vendor who's like on the street just selling produce. Here's like, you know, all of the street food that you want to eat. And um, it, it was so easy and then moving to Detroit it was like I have to really work for this I really have like Mm. I don't know how to make this with Iraqi ingredients or like Egyptian ingredients (laughs) I'm gonna have to figure out how to do this and like the the we didn't have a car at the time so like this special trip to the one huge Asian market in a different town like 40 minutes away was like all right here's the big trip like we got to get all the ingredients that we need now spend hundreds of dollars and we probably won't go there for the next couple of months. Mm-hmm. So I get that. I get that. Like it, it takes a lot of planning to like preserve the, that food history, that food culture when you don't live in an area that, that supports it or that holds it in the same way. Yeah. We're so lucky. To, well, I live in LA now, so definitely very lucky, but also now there's that, say we company that can deliver Chinese groceries to you and wow like I this is incredible I never you know when I was living in Montreal and it wasn't it was basically impossible to get these ingredients my parents actually had to pack Chinese ingredients like in their luggage when we visited over summer to like use in Montreal so we've come a long way yeah, yeah, for sure. That belief buy on box of goodies from family yeah. in the Philippines or like uh-huh. across the country has always been like the treat. And like, I tried to like explain what that thrill is to my husband. And he's just like, it's just, it's just goody. Like we watched Minari the other night and there's like a scene where her mom comes and she's like crying about anchovies. And Chris is like, that's you. And I'm like, you don't know what it feels like <laughs> to, to, not have it, to be yeah. like, to be like, it doesn't exist. And you, what are you going to do? You know? So I was like, mm-hmm. it's the thrill of a belief buy on box. <laughs> so good. Totally. All right. Kat. Um, Carol, do you have to jump? 
yes, I need to go and actually talk okay. to Kevin for the first time today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank for this you combo. for having um, me. It's <laughs> been so fun. Nice to Say hello to Kevin for us. <laughs> Have a good rest of your night. You Take care. Enjoy your food. Thank you. All right, Kat, what's the next step? So my meat is cooked. Am I adding yeah, my eggplant so, back in? Yeah, go ahead and add your ar aromatics. The, the okay. garlic, the um, onion, chili, ginger. The green onion and ginger. Yeah, I added a little bit of the bean sauce because I have it in my fridge. Um, okay. So I like to add it to most of my cooking. Um, I don't know if you have this. It's just as I, I added it to the sauce bit. Oh yeah, you already did. Great. So then after the aromas start to come out, you want to uh, yeah, put the eggplant back in and then stir in the sauce. Okay. Mm, I can smell my ginger. Yeah, I always use way more garlic than the recipe calls for. I do too. <laughs> oh god, it's like two garlic. Oh, so you mean like twelve garlics, right? Like yeah, like, exactly. Like I don't know what we're talking about here. I'm gonna sneak a tiny bite of eggplant. Oh, mm. can you hear that? I don't know if you can hear it. Hear what? It's so crunchy. No. The, oh. the crunch of my eggplant. <laughs> oh, so you made it. It's like super crunchy. It's, it's basically like tempura. It's so good. I'm super excited. Okay. This is in, and I'm glad I have eggplant left over so I can make some more for another time. All right, so that's in. And now the sauce, yes? Yes, stir in the sauce. And then you're basically done. You'll just need to make sure that you know, the sauce thickens a little bit, but yeah, that's it. That's the dish. Ah, I'm so excited. It smells so good in my kitchen. Yeah, me too. Mine too. Hmm. Did you save the greens of the green onions? I didn't. I threw them in, but I have more green onion that I can throw on top. It doesn't matter. It just kind of looks pretty. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure it's like contrast in like cooked green onion versus um, mm -hmm. like crunchy fresh green onion. I'm so excited about this dinner. Me too. I think, I think what's, what's great about this, I mean, I mean, obviously the conversation that I'm having with people about this, right, is like, it's important um, it's meaningful to to the people that I'm having it with and myself, but also we just get to eat really delicious food. <laughs> oh yeah, I got and I'm, pretty jealous. I'm not anti food, you know, like yeah, I'm I'm legit like thinking about what friends I can rope into doing this with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please, <laughs> please, please, please take it and run late because I know yeah. I'm hungry. I know a hungry boy in the other room. I know a hungry dog who's looking to get into something. Do your dogs eat people food or are they just like strictly so like they can no, really they're very or... well the new puppy I'm not sure yet but Tommen is super sensitive and will get mm. diarrhea so no oh that's a shame that's a shame yeah. well Gene sometimes very much can... like Jean is very much like, give me all the human food, please. Thank you. Yeah. Won't eat. That's great. When I started, I I when I started to cook for him, mm -hmm. when I started to cook for him, he was like, this is all I want to eat. Thank you. Only your yeah. food. And now it's like combo. Okay. I have rice. This plate is messy. That's okay. I also played in mine over rice. <laughs> I'm going to plate next to the rice so that Ooh. I can, so I can like show it off, take a pretty picture. This is a messy plate, but um, I'll do a prettier plate for the next one.
All right. Have you started being already? Yay. No, I'm just, <laughs> just tasting. I'm going to taste it with my brownie yeah. for. It's so oh, good. I'll eat the messy one. I'm going to take that as a photo, but I'll eat the, the messier one because I can, I can taste it now. Mm. This is hot. Mm hmm. But it's so good. Oh, so good. It's like perfect spicy. So savory. Mm. I'll have to try it with impossible meat. I had an impossible mm -hmm. burger for the first time the other day. And I was like, it kind mm -hmm. of tastes like Spam. And I love Spam, mm -hmm. so I'm too bad. <laughs> it, it honestly mm -hmm. soaks up whatever flavoring you put in it. So I can't mm -hmm. even taste the difference if you flavor it right. Mm -hmm. Well, so good. thank you so much, Kat. Um, Thanks for having I me. I really appreciate you being on, talking with me about food. Um, I'm going to take a selfie of us because, okay. of course, I will. Should the food be in it? Um, it can. It doesn't have to be. 